UFC Fight Night, Aspinall versus Tibera. Tomorrow we have a great card taking place in the O2 Arena in London, one of the best venues in MMA, if not all of sports. Uh, it features Aspinall versus Tibera, uh, the return of Tom Aspinall after a year layoff due to injury. This fight is going to be a lot of fun, and I'm going to go through each of the fights on the card and breaking down my predictions for each fight. Starting with the flyweight division, we have Rafael Filio versus Daniel Barres. Filio, Filio is going to be the slight favorite in this one. He's got a one and one record in the UFC, coming off a most recent loss to Mohamed Mokhaev. His opponent, his opponent is Daniel Barres, who lost a close decision in the Contender Series, went on a four fight win streak, and so he's coming into this fight with a lot of momentum. I think this is a really good matchup between two guys who are pretty dangerous everywhere. Filio definitely gave Mokhaev his hardest fight to date. Mikhaev is a guy with a lot of hype and Filio basically ripped his knee apart during the fight. Mikhaev is just built different. There's no other way to put it. Did not tap, let his knee, he said it was crackling, let his knee snap, crackle, pop, and then went on to finish Filio after that on a bum leg. So definitely impressive to get a guy as uh, skilled a grappler as Mokhaev in that position. And, you know, Filio probably would have finished 99% of fighters on the roster in that position. Um, he's a guy who's very good grappling, but also has very good hands, has some KO wins as well. Daniel Barres is a pure finisher as well. Um, he's, at, he's on a four fight finish streak since his contender series loss comes in with really good hands. He fights out of Spain. So this fight is not going the distance. I think Filios is the better grappler of these two and is similarly as powerful in the striking department as Daniel Barres. I think Filio gets a finish in this fight and uh, cashes as a slight favorite. Next up is a strawweight fight between Shauna Bannon who is making her UFC debut out of Ireland. She's taking on Bruna Brazil, um, a fighter with a bit more uh, UFC experience. She's got a couple fights under her belt. Shonda Bannon is only, has only had five or so professional fights, um, gone undefeated in that time, but has had uh, her moments where she hasn't looked so dominant, but she is a very uh, skilled striker, throws a lot of cool kicks and stuff and definitely looks really accurate with her striking. Bruna Brazil uh, has had her ups and downs in the UFC. She started out red hot with a walk-off KO on the Contender Series um, where she just flat put the other girl's lights out with a high kick. It was absolutely electric. But she herself is prone to getting KO'd. Um, she has been finished a couple times before, which is concerning. Uh, you don't see as many finishes, certainly in this division, but I don't see Shauna Bannon as that much of a threat, um, a finishing threat on the feet. I just don't know if she really has that power, hasn't really proved that. Um, so she definitely has an opportunity to do that here, but I'm taking Bruna Brazil by decision here just due to the experience difference between the two. Next up is a lightweight fight between Chris Duncan and Yanal Ashmuz. Duncan is a 10 and one fighter. Um, he lost his Dana White contender series to Vyacheslav Borshev. Um, took a body punch KO that just completely shut his body down, shot right to the liver. Just a beautiful punch from Borshev. But he is 10-1, that was his sole loss, and he's coming off of a back-to-back -back wins in the UFC now, most recently versus Omar Morales. Um, and he is taking on Yanal Ashmuz, who is the slight uh, underdog in this one, is sitting at around plus 110. Yanal is undefeated. He came in out of nowhere to take on Sam Patterson, was giving up basically a half a foot versus the guy, 
and just rocked Patterson, caught a kick, hit him with a combo, and then just, at, just beat the heck out of him when he was on the ground. Had Sam Patterson seeing ghosts when he stood up. Sam Patterson was grappling the ref. He was grappling his coaches. It was an ugly scene. So we know that Yanal is powerful, packs a big punch. I'm liking Yanal Ashmoos by KO in this one. Duncan has a tendency to get into brawls and gets hit a lot. His contender series fight that earned him his contract was a crazy comeback win where he got dropped like a hundred times in the first round. It was crazy. The guy has an insane chin in terms of not going out, but he is chinny in the sense that it, when people find the home, he, he can get dropped pretty easily. So he's like impossible to put away, at least from you know, hitting him in the head we've seen so, so far, but um, he can get dropped. I just don't see his chin holding up versus a guy like Ashmuz though, who's so powerful. Um, I just don't think you can continue to take the shots that Chris Duncan takes and expect to survive them. So Ashmuz is the pick here by KO. Next up is a women's bantamweight fight between Ketlin Vieira and Penny Kianzad. Vieira is the minus 160 favorite in this one. She is three and two in her last five. Panny, on the other hand, is four and one in her last five and is coming in at a plus 135 underdog. Both share losses to Raquel Pennington. Um, both have um, some good wins outside of that. Panny is very strong in the clinch. Um, she's a fighter who wasn't as much on my radar until I just started watching her fights in preparation with the video. But she's good in the clinch, throws a lot of elbows and knees. She's a good Muay Thai style fighter. She got wild in her last fight, but recovered. So she's shown that she can fight through adversity. Um, and she is very experienced. She has a lot of fights under her belt. Vera also likes working off the fence and she's got like a big win over Holly Holm. I believe, unless uh, that was a fight that, I forget who, who how that fight ended out, but it, it was a controversial decision. I think actually, Hayo might have robbed that one. I, it, I'm blanking on it, so, uh, so you guys will have to fact check that on your own, but Vieira, definitely a very skilled fighter. Um, despite that, I think Panny is just the more experienced of the two and I like her clinch game a lot. She can really bloody her opponents um, with elbows in close. So I think she wins a decision here and it's uh, it's gonna be a slugfest, I think. Next up is a middleweight fight between Mahmoud Muradov and he's taking on Brian Barbarena who's making his middleweight debut. Uh, Muradov is the large favorite in this one at minus 280. He's three and two in his last fights. Barbarena is 3-2 and two in his last five fights as well, but both of these guys are on two fight loss streaks. Uh, Bar Barbarena's losses came at the hands of Gunnar Nelson and RDA, so um, definitely good opponents there. Muradov, on the other hand, lost back-to-back -to, -back to Gerald Mearshart and Kyle Ohio. Barbarena, you know, hasn't looked the best in his most recent two fights, although yes, he was um, taking on Barbarena and RDA, but got finished back to back. And, you know, I'm not sure that the move up to middleweight, especially at his stage of his career is really gonna be the cure-all for, you know, his, his recent issues. Muradov is a big guy, he's powerful. Um, he's had a couple of losses, but now he's gonna be taking on a guy who he's just naturally, naturally gonna be bigger than, stronger than. I think he gets a KO here versus Barbarena. Um, but, you know, huge respect to Barbarena. This dude will take on anyone, just total gamer. So, you know, nothing will surprise me coming from his end. Next is a heavyweight fight between Mick Parkin and Jamal Pogues. Parkin is a fighter who came to the contender series, um, you know, pretty sizable underdog, but um, persevered through that fight. He got wobbled a couple times, but you know, he just outlasted the other guy. And once he was able to take the other guy down, just pretty much pummeled him. Um, <clears throat> the cardio of the other guy was 
really concerning, but I think it also shows that McParkin can take a hit and you know keep going, and he's got a lot of gas in the tank. He's been training with Tommy Aspinall and Philip DeFries as well. He's like one of their main training partners, so you know that he's getting it in with you know some of the best guys in the world, heavyweights, and I think that's a huge advantage because most of these heavyweights really, I think one of the hardest things is finding good training partners for them. There's just not many guys that big who can sort of simulate the athleticism of being in the UFC and fighting another guy your size. So you know that he's been getting in as good of training as really anyone possibly could at that weight class. He's taking on Jamal Pogues, who is the big favorite in this one at minus 160. Pogues isn't exactly a power puncher, um, despite being that big. He more likes to use his grappling, um, but definitely can't hurt big guys on the feet. Anyone really can in the heavyweight division. Um, he's a good wrestler. He most recently beat uh, Parisian, where he, he was able to take Josh Parisian down and sort of control him. But I don't think he's going to be able to do that against Parkin. I think Parkin's going to be one of the better grapplers in this division. Um, doesn't have a lot of fights under his belt. He's only like five or six and oh. But I think this is a good matchup for Parkin um, where he's going to get the chance to prove his grappling against another guy who has a similar skill set. And Mick Parkin, I think he just, he just knows how to use his weight. And if he gets on top of Jamal, I do not see Jamal being able to get up so I think Parkin gets on top of him and KOs him just by you know, just re re repeatedly hitting him with shots and not letting him get up. Next up is a lightweight fight between Mark Jaquise and Yoel Alvarez. Jaquise is two and three in his last five fights. Yoel is four and one in his last five. Um, Yoel is the big favorite in this one coming in at minus 180. So you can get good value on Jaquise at around plus 155. Uh, Jaquise, you know, he's been fighting a lot of the top guys. He's got losses to Michael Johnson, who maybe not one of the top guys you would say, but Michael Johnson is, is a tough matchup for really anyone in the lightweight division, just his experience and the guy's been in there with everyone, as well as uh, Alves and Faziv. So, you know, the, the two and three in the last five, I think that does not accurately represent how good Jaquise is. He's really well-rounded. He's a good grappler. Um, his, through his wins versus uh, Borshev and Hedzovic, he really has wrestled his way to a win in those two fights. So that's kind of his key to victory in this one. Yoel, on the other hand, is a guy who just got completely out-wrestled and pummeled versus Sarukian. Um, I did have high hopes for Yoel going into that fight versus Sarukian because I just wasn't really hit to how good Armand truly was. But in retrospect, I mean, Armand is, I think he's a top three guy in the lightweight division for sure. Talent-wise, his, his grab, I think his wrestling is second to none, only to maybe Islam, um, which I even think he, his wrestling could match up with. Islam's um, he even in the early rounds at least versus Mateus Armand you know was winning the grappling exchange, exchanges is more of a cardio thing but enough about him you all took a year off because he got beat to a pulp but I think he's going to come back strong in this one he's the more explosive fighter of the two I saw a crazy statistic that like Luke Thomas tweeted that Yoel Alvarez has a 0% takedown defense He's like 0 for 6, but he's a guy who I think is comfortable fighting off his back, especially when Jaquise is not a guy who's going to just like rain down punches on top. He's more going to try and just lay on you. He's not as active. So I think that plays in Alvarez. I think he could get a sneaky submission off his back if he does get taken down, or I think he'll be able to stand up and um, beat him on the feet. So I think Alvarez finds, finds a finish in this one. And I think that could set up like a sneaky matchup with like Jalen Turner, maybe. Turner's a guy that no one really knows what to do with, but it'd be a cool height matchup. They're both two of the tallest guys in the lightweight division. So, you know, I think you do Turner versus Yoel. Loser has to go to welterweight or, or something like that. 
Okay, next up we have Danny Roberts and Johnny Parsons. Um, this is a welterweight fight. Danny Roberts is two and three in his last five. He's gonna be a slight underdog in this one at uh, pretty much even odds. Parsons is the slight favorite. He's making his UFC de debut after winning his Dana White Contender Series fight by decision. Uh, Danny Roberts has the big edge in experience. Um, he's got a lot more fights under his belt. Johnny Parsons has, I think he's got 10 fights total. Parsons is a guy who's got a lot of KOs, uh, really powerful striker, but he won his Contender Series fight by decision. And I really like to see guys go on the contender series and find a finish, uh, especially against a guy who more often than not, they're going to be, you know, so they're going to be lower level talent than who, what you're going to find in the UFC. So I think the experience advantage for Danny Roberts gives him an edge in this one. He's also got that home field advantage where the UK fighters are just going to get more favorable um, decisions from the judges. It's just, I think we've seen it time and time again in London no reason why I would stop now. So I think Roberts wins this one by decision. Next up is a bantamweight fight between Davy Grant and Daniel Marcos. Grant is a guy who's three and two in his last five. He's a slight underdog, probably just because Marcos is an undefeated fighter. He's coming in around minus 140. Davy Grant's put together a two fight win streak, wins over Luis Smolka and Rafael Asensal. The fight versus Dustin Sal was just a crazy, crazy upset win. He's down going, he's down in like the last minute of the fight. Of the fight, excuse me. He gets a point taken away from him, but as a result, gets to stand up. Um, which, you know, if that doesn't happen, he probably just gets grappled to uh, a loss, but instead he gets stood up, rocks us and Sal, and then gets him in like a reverse triangle. Absolutely insane. But his opponent in this one, Daniel Marcos, is a really good striker. He comes from Peru. I think Peru is honestly kind of next up. Like There's guys like him. Rolando Bedoya is really good. You got Pueyes, Claudio Pueyes. So, you know, I think we're, we're going to see a good crop of fighters coming from that area, just South America in general. So, um, but yeah, I think just the hands of Daniel Marcos are going to be too much. Davey is explosive, but... Marcos defense strikes really well, and I think he finds a finish in this one. He's not going to want to give uh, the judges a chance to take a win away from him, so finishes the play there. And then uh, we have our first fight on the main card, Lerone Murphy and Joshua Kulabau in the featherweight division. Lerone is the minus 150 favorite. He's got a... He's four... 0-1 oh, in his last five, but it's kind of coming off of a fluky win versus, uh, I believe it's Gabriel Santos. Josh Kulabau is 3-1-1 one, one in his last five. Lerone is a guy who's very explosive. I mean, you take one look at him and he's absolutely chiseled. Um, throws hard, throws it, you know, puts everything into all of his strikes, he's got good kicks. But I think Kulabau is the just better all-around fighter. Um, he's really quick. He's seems like a 145 is a really good spot for him after getting KO'd by John Turner at 155. I think the the it's a good weight for him where his his power um, carries really well at 145. So he hurts people even though he doesn't look like you know he can he can hit that hard. He does wobble people. He got he wobbled like Sung Woo Choi a bunch of times in their fight, and he's also just slick like he tripped uh, Bagdasarian in their fight and took his neck in like seconds. Like I really have never seen anything like that. A guy get their back taken so quick and lock in a submission. I think he's just the more skilled fighter right now between the two. Lerone, maybe you could argue as a higher ceiling, but uh, that's not gonna help him right now in this fight. Kulabau by decision is the pick, but Lerone is definitely a dangerous fighter. Next is a lightweight fight between Jai Herbert and Ferez Zion. Uh, Herbert is two, two and one in his last five with, and Zion is three and two in his last five. Ferez, uh, the line has shifted a lot from like kind of a pick em when the fight was, you know, last week, but Zion is now 
Um, the money's moved the line to about a 165 favorite for Zam. Zam's a guy who, this is his first fight back in the UFC after he was uh, re released by him. Don't really know what the circumstances were surrounding his release. He hasn't fought in any promotion since then, but um, you know, now he's back. He's a guy who's striking wise, he's as credentialed as anyone in the lightweight division. I think he's got like a K1 belt under his uh under his belt, whatever. Um so he's a really good striker, good in the clinch and a good grappler, but he's a younger guy, he's only twenty six. Um, even though he's got the same amount of fights as Jai Herbert, I still would say, or he might even have like a fight, one more fight than Jai. I think Jai's, Jai's just been training MMA for longer, so he's going to be the better, uh, well-rounded fighter between the two. I like Jai's value here a lot. You're getting plus money with him, and who knows, the, that line could even move more into Zim's favor, uh, leading up to the fight. So if you can get Jai, you know, plus 180, plus 170, I think that's great value. Um, Jai, he got dropped by Ilya Topuria, um, with a crazy combo that would put anyone out. But even in that same fight, Jai had a lot of positives and he bounced back versus Ludovic Klein, kind of just got the win stolen from him because he got a point taken away. You know, I guess it's on him, but he'll definitely be more mindful of, you know, committing any penalties in this one, any fouls. But so I think Jai by decision is the play here. Um, you're getting good value from him. And I think his ex experience and just well-roundedness might be too much for Far SEM. Next, we have a middleweight fight between Paul Craig, who's making his middleweight debut. Um, he's three and two in his last five, and he's taking on Andre Muniz, who's a minus two twenty favorite. <clears throat> Muniz is four and one in his last five. Um, yeah, as I said, Craig's making his middleweight debut. Uh, you know, kind of late in the game to be switching it up. He's thirty five years old. You'd think that he would make this change earlier in his career, but he was having a lot of success. Um, most recently, he took on Johnny Walker, though, and just got bullied in that fight. You could tell that the size was just too much. And he once he couldn't take Johnny Walker down, he just got pounded. So I get why that fight would, you know, be an eye-opener for him to move down to 185. He's taking on a guy with a similar skill set, skill set, and Andre Muniz. Both are grapplers. You know, Muniz was the grappler in the middleweight division before fighting Brendan Allen most recently and getting out grappled and submitted in that fight. That being said, I, I think Muniz is going to have the slight edge in grappling in this one, which is why I'm going to take him by submission. Paul Craig is pretty one-dimensional in that aspect, although, you know. He's found a way to get a bunch of submissions in the UFC. So I think in a pure grappling match, Muniz, I'm going to give him the edge. And I think I see, that's how this fight is going to play out. If Paul Craig shows up to the octagon, he's just looking massive, way bigger than Muniz. Uh, I might start second guessing this. You know, I think he said he in an interview that he expects to come in the cage around 220, something like that. I don't know if I see that happening. 40 pounds overnight would be a crazy weight to swell, but I guess you never know. Still, Muniz by submission is going to be the pick, and I'm riding with that for now. Next up, we have a featherweight fight between Nathaniel Wood and Andre Feely. Nathaniel Wood is the minus 190, 190 favorite. He's 3-2 and two in his last five fights. Feely's coming in at a plus 160 or so underdog. He's 2-2-1 two, two, and one in his last five. This is uh, Nathaniel Wood's third fight at featherweight. His um, He was in the bantamweight division before that, but I think it, this has been a phenomenal transition for him. The power does seem to carry over to 145. Um, he showed that in his win over Charles Jordan, where he... You know, it was showing that when he was hitting Jordan that he was wobbling him. I think he got a knockdown or two in that fight. Certainly, you know, 
rung his bell a, a bunch of times. And so the power is translating, and then he it, he still has that like bantamweight speed though. So I think he's looked really good at 145. Feely, on the other hand, is coming off a win versus Algio. The height difference is going to be something to overcome for Wood. He's given up a few inches in height as well as reach, but I think he's crafty enough to navigate that. Um, yeah, that's the big thing I would say about Wood is he's just really crafty. Uh, in the Jordan fight, he had a lot of cheeky trips and stuff like that. And, you know, the guy's just a gamer, and I think he knows how to win. So I am taking Wood by KO in this fight. Our co-main event is a strawweight fight between Meatball Molly and Julia Stolyarenko. Molly is a minus 260 favorite in this one, um, which with Stolyarenko being a 2-1 to one underdog. Molly... Obviously, just got blanched on in her most recent fight. Um, in retrospect, that's kind of always how that fight was going to play out. Just the, the grappling difference is too much. Blanchfield is probably the best grappler in that division. And Molly, you know, that, that's just not really her game. She's gonna, she wants to stand and bang. And when it comes to brawling, I think Molly can brawl with the best of them. Um, so, you know, matchmaking from the... UFC's point of view, I guess they just wanted to prop up Blanchfield. I'm sure they had anticipated that happening, but at the same time, you know, if, if you're Molly, you want to take on the best of the best and you're serious about fighting for the belt, that's a fight that you're probably going to have to take on sooner or later. So, uh, but in this one, Stolyarenko, she's a fighter who she just got KO'd by Chelsea Chandler. Um, She's coming down from bantamweight, so I'm not sure how that... She did make weight this morning, but I'm not sure how well she's really going to be feeling after having to shed all those pounds. Uh, you know, 10 pounds when you're from 135 to 125, I think it is. I mean, that's a big difference. And if she just got ch KO'd by Chelsea Chandler and she's smaller, she's probably going to be easier to KO. And I think Molly just hits harder. So... I think this is a get right fight for Meatball, and I think she finds a KO in this one and just sets the ring on fire. She is, in terms of just hype value, I think she's top 10, top 15 in the UFC, you know, regardless of gender. gender. She's just absolutely electric, especially in the O2. She should only fight in the O2. Like, I don't care. Um, Finally, we have our main event. We got Tom Aspinall taking on Marcin Tibura. Aspinall is the basically four and a half to one favorite in this one. Tibura is coming in at like plus 340. Aspinall, or both of these fighters are four and one in the last five fights. Aspinall does have that asterisk though, because his most recent loss obviously was to Curtis Blades where he tore his ACL within a minute of the fight. So heartbreaking to see, because that was a matchup that I was really anticipating. How well does Aspinall's skill set stack up against a guy like Curtis Blades, who's big as hell, strong as hell, and has that wrestling background? So I really hope we get to see that fight. The big question here is really how is Tom going to look after that ACL injury? He basically is making his return almost a year to the date, maybe it was like 13 months or so, which is a pretty quick turnaround for an ACL surgery. I mean, I know if it was football or something that lots of those guys can't make that quick of a turnaround, that'd be kind of pushing it, but fighting is a different sport. The biggest aspect of Tom Aspinall's game in my, in my eyes though is his quickness. I think that's his biggest advantage over other fighters in the heavyweight division. The guy was so quick, fast hands, nimble on his feet, does not move like someone his size should move, six foot five. But he did come in at his highest weight ever. So take that as you will. It, it could mean one of two things. It can mean one, he's bulking up to deal with the grappling of Tibera because that's what Marching's gonna wanna do in this fight. He's gonna wanna take Aspinall down. So it can mean that, or it can mean, you know, 
that he's wasn't doing the same amount of cardio due to the leg injury or something and, and you know maybe he didn't even mean to bulk up on purpose but the guy is so scientific and tactical I, f I feel like that Aspinall if he bulked up that it was purposeful I think he's they got just complete control of him he's his dad's his coach and you hear them talk and you think they're talking about chess or something not fighting they're just so scientific about how they do things over there Aspinall is as talented as anyone in the heavyweight division um he's a guy who had aspirations for the belt before this injury and I'm sure those aspirations are the same at four to one I don't really see the value in taking his money line you got to put down so much to see any return on it uh I think taking a finish in this fight you're getting a slightly better value it's not I wouldn't expect to see these guys go five five rounds just I never anticipate out of heavyweights and Tiber is a guy who has shown that he, he slows down. So I think this is a perfect matchup for Aspinall to get his feet wet again against a guy who's had a lot of success in the heavyweight division and just to gain back that momentum that he had so much of before um, his ACL injury. So Aspinall by finish is the pick and I'm sure he's going to just bring the energy his, his walkouts are absolutely top notch. They're gonna get the chanting going. It's gonna be electric. So Aspinall is the pick and that is the picks for this card. Hope you enjoyed, like, comment, all that. Let me know your thoughts and take care y'all.